So here we all are as, as stakeholders in this great project. We have all committed our work to the land. We are all understanding that we have a lot of work to do in this transition together. So everyone's going to start with where they sit from where are they working for that work. Hello, everybody. Yeah, my name is Erin. I'm from Canada. For the last 20 years, I have worked with a small, I've owned a small grocery store that brings farmers up through from conventional farming to regenerative farming in a supply chain maneuver. Um, so I'm interested in how the supply chain works here in New Zealand and how we can bring those smaller producers who are changing up into the system and get you guys connected to them. That's really important to me. Also working, I'm finding there's a pinch point within training. So everybody who wants to make this change then is looking for direction as to what do I do next? What are the first steps? So I'm very fascinated as to where that pinch point is and how we can grow it. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, my name is Sam Lang. Um, a hill country farmer from Hawke's Bay and an aspiring agroecologist. Um, and my work at the moment is really around connecting with the sort of emerging regenerative farming communities around the country uh, and having a background in uh, climate change and policy and a few other things, trying to bridge those conversations. Um, and most recently with a uh, big research proposal we put to the government uh, around regenerative agriculture. And moving cows. And I like moving cows. <laughs> Kia ora, my name is Hannah. I come from Tauranga. Uh, I have a background in sales and marketing, mainly with Living Earth Compost, which is the biggest municipal composting company in New Zealand and in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I then went on to leave the kind of business world to become the grower or the artisan farmer. So I've had the pleasure of going up to North America um, and working with some of the world's best regenerative agriculturalists and small scale profitable market gardeners. And I've just returned home three months ago and I'm getting the lay of the land and the people and I'm ready to help support the farmers that are here to pull us all together to help restore Papatuanuku and restore a lot of the, the people as well through that process. Nice. My people have been living in Taranaki and Whanganui for 900 years and seriously considering staying. <laughs> <laughs> I realised that, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes is generally regarded in animal husbandry as a recessive gene. <laughs> so we've been strengthening the gene pool of those who arrived in settler ships for a while. Uh, I'm kind of representing uh, the, the new landlords, the people who've been uh, guardians in Kaitiaki for a long time, who are now new landlords in a corporate designed uh, incorporated farm. So the short bit of that is like a number of people here, I'm a shareholder in the second largest provider of milk fats for Fonterra, 40,000 acres of PKW Incorporation in Taranaki, and 101,000 acres of dry stock farming on, on and around the Whanganui River from the Atiho Incorporation. So finding the holy trinity between being essentially a nation within a nation who are financially illiterate, going back to the, to, to the understanding of our relationship with the Ngahi there and dealing with that uh, in another uh, realm and, and redesigning what that looks like for us. So on behalf of other landlords, I welcome you here. Hi, um, I'm Shane Gooley. I am the manager of the investment portfolio at the Ministry for Primary Industries. Uh, which is a really long title. Um, what my team does is uh, we look for partnerships um, and investment opportunities. So our big challenge is bringing new voices into what the future of the primary industries will look like for New Zealand. And do you have land? Me personally. Does the min there's more, as government managed lands in New Zealand, are those a place where the public is learning about the best regenerative practices? Are there opportunities for new growers and older growers to be modeling those practices, is that part of our work? Uh, not for, primary Industries doesn't actually own land, but we work with land owners to, to look at new ways of doing things and bring new voices into that. I, I'm a landowner. Yeah. I've got a still good title in Diamond Harbour and also in Greylin. <laughs> <laughs> and 40,000 acres in Taranaki. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit, this is for the, the younger farmers, what is the social change that is part of this work? How is this a safe space for a dialogue across generations, across traditions? From what I've experienced um, overseas in America and in, yeah, and in Canada as well, um, and since coming back home, there are a lot of parallels that I see happening, um, and it happens within this very um, framework with what, what we've, with what we've got. We've got 900 years of, of Tangata Whenua who have been living very closely with the land. Um, they know it very, very well, and they have their own worldview, if I can speak for this a little bit. 
Um, and I've seen that as a Pākehā, and I've seen it iterated in um, a similar thing happening in North America with Native American culture, and I've seen it here as well. And New Zealand, we're in the same room, we're talking around land, which is very, a difficult topic. But we're New Zealanders and we kind of do it. We can't leave the island, we're here. Um, I would like to see that everyone can work together in this room from all levels within regenerative agriculture as a potential model for that. But it is about creating a safe environment for, to call people out of the hills, no matter what you're working for, no matter what your personal style of agriculture is, but to come and talk about the, the soil because soil is a common ground in itself. Um, we can't own it, but we can restore it and from whatever angle we're coming from, but it's about coming into a room where we can do that collectively and safely in order to restore our waterways. And I think we're doing that already right now, which is planting the seed. Yeah. Can we talk about the relationship of land health with human health and how will we know when we're winning? Maybe you could talk about animal health. Um, and he could talk about human health, and you could talk about grocery store health. <laughs> yeah, um, so I suppose one of the kind of epiphanies for me of sorts, I was travelling around the world about three years ago with the, with the view to, the, with, the, with the question, how can we support rural communities in this impending transition, and what does that look like? And that's what led me to, in this, we call it regenerative agriculture, there's a lot of other names for it, mm. farming with nature. Um, and one of those uh, sort of things that, dawns on you when you hang out with um, health and nutrition people and when you hang out with farmers and, uh, and, and everybody in between is this kind of microbiome thing and, and you start un talking about soil ecology and we had a, a friend of mine was here yesterday who's a soil ecologist and gut microbes and how they basically influence, they basically run this, they basically run us. Um, and the same is true of the soil and the same is true of animals and actually when, and coming back to starting with the soil and actually you know, soil runs off minerals, microbes, and organic matter, and um, in many ways we've been suppressing the micro part of that equation um, with what we call maybe industrial farming systems or practices and that. And so actually when we flip that equation, we actually work on the, on the microbes piece, the organic matter piece falls into place and everything sort of rolls on from there, and there's just this direct correlation in health um, across all systems once you get that sort of soil microbe um, piece happening, and that is the kind of preventative healthcare um, approach that I'm really excited about. Yeah. And happiness, happiness starts in the gut. It's very connected to your brain sense of well-being. Mm. So you feel much better. Mm. Mm. Like kombucha is in the microbes also. Move forward, get it off my, I don't want the microbe. <laughs> so, so, so one of the things for us is really around, again, coming from a position of not having any kind of executive power authority, but actually having a relationship with mm. something that we've, that we've known uh, innately for, for, for as long as we've been here. And so one of those things is making the transition and saying, can I just talk about the political thing? Uh, so I'm just talking about one as a shareholder. So we're the largest single farmers in Taranaki. Every white farmer's watching. And so, and so if you make one mistake, they're onto you straight away. And the reality, what we're growing, we're not actually growing cows. You know, we're growing the souls of our people for those who've gone, and also young people. And so it's an investment in that. And by the way, you know, we might be the second largest providers of milk outside of Land Court, but actually we're not about cows. And our riparian uh, our planting is much more sophisticated than the others. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're redefining what it is to be Māori by having this as an organism that is an organism that we're, we're part of. And if it wasn't farming, it would be something else. But it brings us back to our relationship with the stripped Mahiri anyway. So we're, ironically, we're coaching other people around and growing the, the hearts and souls of, of our tribe and our young people. And yeah. what's the opportunity for young ones, young Iwi ones, on the lands that are, that are yours? Um, just being involved in the farms and and and, um, and increasing their skill there, and then we're and we're investing in all those other things. So all tribes are doing that in different ways. This just happens to be one of those conduits to doing it that links us back into to the land. It's a kind of quite an unremarkable story, really. That transcends all cultures. That we're but we're we're actually saying we can't just use say these things in terms of more tear tear and chance and a symbiotic relationship and all those kind of things and and all and the, and the, uh, metaphysical stuff without doing the action and then the growth of that is to, you know, farmers that are learning about their whakapapa before the birth of Christ is slightly different from someone just milking cows. Mm -hmm. 
with financial imperatives. Mm. Ours isn't. Mm. So what is that prosperity? What do those uh, increased rural employment options mean from the standpoint of small and medium-sized businesses out on the landscape? You know, the training opportunities for people who are growing up with access to land if they're young iwis or not so much access to land if they're young hipsters, partnership possibilities <laughs> and new enterprise on the landscape. Let's like talk about that from a maybe grocery store world. <laughs> Uh, so I saw it firsthand. We, I come from a city called Winnipeg, 800,000 people. Our province is double the size of New Zealand. We only have 1.3 million people, so it is a rural landscape. Um, we'd work with over 100 different farmers in our province and bring them in and move them through the supply chain to get them up to regenerative organic. And the process in doing that, you would see layering start to happen, layering of um, different industries on that same farm as things went along. And when we brought our customers into that story, people are hungry for it. Everybody wants to know how I can help in this, in this revitalization of the landscape, in this healing of the earth. How can I feel a part of it? There's a hunger out there. Mm -hmm. And when the consumers who are eating the food, we're all eaters, when we are a part of that story and that journey, um, it really gives a lot of extra push to it. But I would see, as people move to regenerative industries, suddenly there's a meat processing plant on the land. Suddenly the kids are doing uh, chickens on the side. There's suddenly there's layering of opportunity and a vibrancy that comes back to rural communities. So not just one pasture, but a hoop house, an orchard. Oh, she wants it. Okay, sorry. There are a lot more enterprises stacked on top one through in the other, working together, cycling the nutrients much more effectively between themselves, and making more economic output per acre, more nutrition per acre, more soil health per acre, more microbes per acre, but also more money per acre because there's more bodies making more value. So um, what kind of question for our uh, government man? Yay. Does this government have a... <laughs> <laughs> you have a mandate to see the increase of this work and to invite more innovators into this space yeah. and to partner more deliberately and to, what was the word, grow this sector. Yeah. Do you not? Let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah, so and I think, I think the, the, the point that you just made around how do we get more people connected back into the land and how do we actually open up pathways for our youth, which still feels me weird saying that because I still kind of feel youth adjacent. Um, <laughs> but when you think about it, New Zealand is of the land. Um, and the, I think the good thing where um, community desires and, and consumerism is kind of going now is back actually to more connectedness. So people want to know where the food is coming from. People want to know and see authenticity in their organisations. Their consumer demand? Yes. Yeah. OK, sorry. Yeah, so that, but the good thing is that's actually changing the way that the economy works from, from farming um, and from the, for the primary industry. So it's actually opening up more opportunities for youth. If you look at the, the changes in technology, if you look at the changes in culture, um, that is a youth-driven culture now. Um, and if our rural communities are going to survive, that's going to come from the next generation and the generation after that. Um, so we have to be involved, we have to have the conversation, and we have to be future focused. So relatively cheap housing in rural areas, you cute server boys, <laughs> come on over <laughs> and let's co-work together. But can we talk actually just a little bit about the mapping of opportunities for learning, for sharing, um, for training, for transition, for succession, for success, how are we welcoming in this work and all those who we're working with? And like, what's some of the work ahead in terms of mapping that network of resources that already exist here in Aotearoa and in the outside world? And what some of that has been? Uh, I, think, I think it's about getting in the same room and talking together. That is the first step, getting everyone down from the hills. And that includes the consumers in the cities because they are the ones that often drive a lot of the trend and the food, and they are the consumers. Um, and I know that in New Zealand at the moment, there is, you know, a, from watching from afar, there is the rural urban divide starting to happen. And I would like to see more of the young farmers from the next generation that are coming through that we need to enable um, being a little bit more respected as farmers and having a higher standing within society. Um, so that, first of all, means going out and seeing who is out there. Um, we've got 
many good people like Bostock. The Bostock brothers are doing apples. We've got some people um, in Hikarangi Enterprises just absolutely leading the way with the land use, that, that the land that they've got and needing to bring their people back home in that process that have got an economy to live on. Um, we've got our dairy farmers who are doing young farmers, but we've also got people that are living in isolation all around New Zealand at the moment. And I think that's kind of what I've heard echoing around the place is that farmers are in isolation. Uh, we see this through depression and through the high suicide rates that we've got. Um, and then we've also got our hum humble farmers that are very full of humility that have got amazing ideas. They're watching their salad farm grow of pasture and they're seeing that it works, but they're not quite feeling like they can share it with someone else because, you know, they're not putting tonnes of superphosphate or whatever it is onto the land. So it's about creating that safe community, and I think that first mapping out and getting together is the, the first thing. Yeah, and I suppose off the back of that, I think the really exciting thing is that um, what I'm seeing across the country and kind of what, some of us working in this space kind of see and feel is that there's probably 10% plus farmers who already think in a, call it a biological and ecological mindset that are actually doing things on their farm like that, but often just in quite a, uh, an insular way because they, they have the, you know, rural communities are super connected, super tight, and we've got this kind of tall poppy thing which is, is, is rife in rural communities as anywhere else, and it's also rife across the entire sector. So mm. we've got this it feels to me, and I'm playing with this idea that actually our sector is so connected that it actually promotes homogeneity, um, and, and we tend to tend to chop that down. But the exciting thing there is that as this, um, you know, I'm just saying, Pretty kind brave. of, yeah, the, the flip side of that conversation is that these groups of farmers and others that they're connecting with that are just pop coming out of the woodwork. You know, it's it's an exponential growth curve. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike Taitoko Ta spoke spoke to that a bit yesterday. And the cool thing is that once we tip that balance because everybody is so connected, and this is the, you know, the interesting conversation with government around policy barriers and, and enabling things, is actually once we tip that, um, it feels like that shift could be rapid and quite different perhaps to other countries around the world because of that. So um, yeah, it's that sort of social change lens which is just getting really exciting. So, so I, I also want to mention, um, without making it a history lecture, you know, 1963, 64 was the year that Māori move from being a rural to urban. That was the flip side. So we've been more urban since 63, 64. And so part of the change, and it didn't mean that we were disconnected in any way, but we had to drive past white farms uh, to our reserves. And so now we've kind of got the farms back. And so there's a lot of catch up happening for our people. So some of it, it doesn't mean that our people aren't in part of this kind of conversation, but the transition is, is a big one back. So the, most of our people are not in that space, but are there spiritually. Uh, also, so the kind of functional stuff that we're describing is also part of the renaissance in terms of the catch-up mm -hmm. in that space. And so you mustn't leave us behind, um, and otherwise it becomes, you know, the conversation of the, those who come from leafy suburbs and now leafy suburbs in rural areas, mm -hmm. and that's not being scathing. That's so we are catching up at the same time as reinstate, re redetermining what it is for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can, can I speak to that because um, this is me personally, but I'd like to get behind iwi because I, I see that, you know, and you're in the path to self-determination again and to having a place because there are a lot of answers to our dilemma that is sitting right next to me and his whole lineage and going forward too. So I'd like to listen in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. The, way, the, the working together part of this, you know, we were doing a little, we had our farm hack session uh, day before yesterday, and we were all doing kind of resource mapping, decentralized process of brainstorming what already is here, who's connected to what, what opportunities are where. And Savannah, there was a handsome, it wasn't an abstract handsome surfer hipster, it was an actual one saying, well, we don't know how to get access to land. And Savannah said, well, you know, have you talked to the Marai? They have land. So what would it mean to be in cahoots from the beginning, working together, not us versus them, landlord versus tenant, tenant intergenerational tension, mom versus dad, da, you know, all these patriarchies and colonialisms and coercions that have been a part of our extraction project. What is it to be non-coercive with one another in cooperative, accelerating circles of engagement and excitement? And She's one, she, this one has managed a lot of um, spreadsheets and complexity to know 
that all these products come together on the shelf. So hopefully you have some kind of synthesis because we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a field trip. You can announce that. Oh, yes, you can announce that. You know about it. Um, thanks to Mike, where there's a field trip for going out in the field and talking, talking in the paddock, talking, uh, what do they say, outstanding in the field. <laughs> Uh, if you'd like to come along and increase your uh, embodied understanding of what is at stake, what is possible, and what a spongy earth feels like that holds the moisture from the rain because of all the life from the soil, and you want to see on the faces of the people who are caring for the animals that benefit from that health in person and feel it in your personhood and then chat and stuff and have tea, we're going to do it all together. And also, one of the big asks we have in this work of mapping out everything that already exists in the New Zealand ecosystem of Regen Ag for some gas money and some paying girls to do admin and men also to do admin and web presence. So those of you who can, if you want to make a donation to a charity, which we will choose upon receipt of that gift, we'd like to raise 20 grand to accelerate this work for youth entrance for transition, for regenerative ag in New Zealand, and the people on this stage are willing to put in time, and also the other crew that we worked with in all of our workshop sessions. We already have 17 pages. When are we doing the 9 a.m. from the valley, and I have a clipboard. You gotta put your name on the list, and then we will have our total list of names sign up after lunch at the latest today. today. Mike, tomorrow. it's tomorrow. Just to repeat, he said his goal is 100% regenerative agriculture in New Zealand by 2025. And uh, can I also say that carbon, se carbon, carbon uh, is the big hot topic. We've got Climate AKL um, happening in Auckland soon, and soil holds a lot of that carbon, and we have a lot of soil in New Zealand, so we're, we're all speaking the same goal. Yeah. See you there.